Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm on the uh, Rideau Canal Skateway, which is the largest uh, outdoor skateway in the world in Ottawa. It's the last day of a festival, local festival called uh, Winterlude. Now today I'm going to talk about redrawing the map. I'm going to talk about how rapid climate change is actually redrawing the map in so basically there's a lot of these large-scale changes that are occurring on the planet so for a start because of the warming and the huge amount of warming at the equator which is mostly manifested in evaporation of water that heat goes into the latent heat of evaporation the uh, tropics are getting larger so the Hadley cell is expanding northward and southward. So instead of coming down at 30 degrees latitude, creating the deserts there, it's moving the deserts, uh, everything's moving towards the poles because of the warming. So it's actually expanding in size in latitude 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees latitude Per decade that's both in the north and in the south so the total expansion of the tropics is double that which is 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 degrees and uh, that's happened since the uh, 1970s so about for about five decades it's expanded a total of about half a degree per decade that's a total of two and a half degrees which is enormously significant I told you that the, uh, most of the deserts of the world are where the Hadley cell descends. So hot air rises at the equator, then it expands poleward, cools down and descends. The descending air is extremely dry because all the water vapor is removed as the air is risen up, right? It's condensed into clouds, etc. So as a result, not only is there a poleward expansion, but the deserts are getting larger. So the Sahara Desert is 10% larger than it was in 1920. Okay, 10% bigger in area. Okay, another major effect is the... In North America, there's the 100th meridian. Okay, 100 degrees longitude. It separates basically the western US, western Canada from the east. In the east it's wetter, in the west it's drier. And that distinct 100th meridian has shifted 140 miles to the east since 1980. So that represents a, an overall drying. The drier areas are expanding and getting larger. Another significant factor is Tornado Alley has shifted. It's not in Kansas anymore, Oklahoma, like it used to be. It's actually shifted. And I talked about this, I predicted this would happen about four or five years ago, I predicted this, and it's actually been realized. So Tornado Alley has shifted 500 miles to the east in the last 30 years. So that's about 160 miles 165 miles per, per decade shift. Another thing that's happening is the plant hardiness zones. If you're a gardener, you know all about them. They're moving north. In the US, they're moving at 13 miles per decade. Basically, they're based on the, um, you know, how hardy the plants have to be to survive given the conditions in the zone. They're based on the average low temperatures in the winter. So they're shifting towards the pole as we get warming. Now, my hands are freezing, so I'm gonna shift hands and warm up the other one. Okay, let me grab, make sure I don't drop the camera, the phone. Okay, in Canada, the permafrost zone is uh, has moved 80 miles to the north. Okay, so we're losing permafrost at lower the lower 
edge of the permafrost zone. It shifted 80 miles to the north in um, many parts of Canada. Now, also, of course, the, uh, you know, if you do boreholes in the permafrost, you can see an incredible warming. And so you can measure the temperature in this borehole as you go down. And there's an incredible warming deep down into the ground. Okay, another significant factor is that the, the wheat belt is being pushed forward at up to 160 miles per decade. So in Australia, for example, the wheat belt is at the lower portion of the country. And it's basically being shifted off the continent. Okay? The largest wheat producers in the world are Canada, Russia, the US, and then Australia is next as, as far as wheat exports go. But the wheat growing area is being shifted right out of Australia. And in North America, it's being shifted north. But of course, if soils aren't sufficient, then this is a problem because the very pro the most productive wheat growing areas are actually yields are dropping. Okay. Another very significant factor is that lakes are losing winter ice cover in the northern hemisphere. There's actually 1.4 million lakes in the northern hemisphere. A large number of these lakes are losing their uh, ice cover. Okay, so the ice cover is not forming completely. Uh, the ice is starting to form later on in the fall and is thawing earlier in other lakes. This has huge implications to the ecology of these lakes. Okay, uh, hundreds of miles of shift is occurring. Okay, so lakes within those bands are shifting. Of course, it's uh, something like the shift is something like 500 miles in one generation. Okay, so this is a huge, has the, the lakes require this ice cover. Uh, it's very important for the ecology of these lakes because as the water cools down, the most, the highest density of water is at four degrees Celsius. So as you go colder than that, the density of the water decreases. That water stays on the surface and freezes. So what happens is when the lake temperature, so as the water cools at the surface, it sinks and sinks and sinks. You know, as, when it reaches four degrees, it's the maximum density. So the entire vertical column of the lake can be at four degrees. Now that sinking water carries oxygen because it's from the surface, right? So it brings oxygen down to the bottom of the lake. So as that lake is warming, that overturning doesn't happen. And uh, therefore, the bottom of these lakes are becoming deoxygenated. They're not, they're not getting this overturning, seasonal overturning, and therefore the oxygen levels are dropping at the bottom of the lake. So this is not, this is very, very bad news. Okay. Um, another very significant thing that is happening is we know that the, we know about Arctic temperature amplification. We know that the Arctic is warming much, much faster than the rest of the planet because the Arctic is becoming a much darker place. The overall total reflectivity average of the Arctic used to be about 52%, and over 30 years it's dropped to 48%. Okay, that means there's a lot more absorption of light up in the Arctic, there's a lot more warming. So, we mostly talk about the warming based on surface air temperature, for example. A recent study came out that looked at the warming throughout all the layers of the atmosphere, the, the volume of air. How much did the entire volume of air in the Arctic warm? So they looked at something called PCAM, P-C-A-M, polar cold air mass. 
okay how much is it there like temperature weighted and the negative heat content of the air multiplying temperature by density or mass what they're finding is okay the PCAM the polar cold air mass has declined 1% per decade that's for the air at the 280 Kelvin which is about 7 degrees Celsius the PCAM and, and, and the, uh, the negative heat contents declined 3% per decade. But if you look at the 245 Kelvin air, so 245 minus 273, that's about minus uh, 28 or so degrees Celsius. That air mass has declined 13% per decade. In six decades, basically, we've lost 80% of the cold air in the Arctic, defined by that PCAM at 245 Kelvin. Okay, now the trends in the Arctic are even faster. If you look just at the high Arctic, it's about double the loss. Okay, and more recently it's about three times the loss in the last 30 years over the 60-year trend it's about double so in a nutshell we're rapidly losing all of the cold air in the arctic okay um, when you see these really really wavy jet streams going very very far north the ridges up into the north pole in the middle of the winter bringing temperatures above zero and you get these cold air excursions, especially with the uh, split polar vortex coming down and the mass of cold over North America. This is all the trend towards losing snow and ice up in the Arctic. Okay, there's lots of these effects happening because the Arctic is turning into a much, much warmer place. And of course, this is very bad news for Greenland melt rates, it's very, very bad news for methane. Okay, a permafrost melt, both terrestrial and marine, is uh, going to skyrocket when we lose the sea ice. And, you know, Michael Mann has been talking a lot about trying to downplay the effects of methane. And people, of course, I disagree with him completely. You know, many years ago, um, I joined the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, if you'll recall. Okay, uh, about a month after it was founded. That was about eight or nine years ago now. So methane is a huge concern. You know, remember the global warming potential of methane is enormous. Right, and uh, most of the numbers that are quoted for how much more potent methane is caused to cause warming than co2 you know is, is the numbers were 20 were quoted 22 24 you know it's actually 34 times more potent that's on a hundred year average time scale but the lifetime of methane is only about 9 to 12 years depending on latitude etc okay so a more relevant number is a 20-year time scale for methane and the global warming potential it's 86 times worse 86 times more warming from per per uh, mass methane versus co2 and on a few year time scale the uh, global warming potential is 150 to 200 times more potent methane is on the rise around the world right fracking hasn't helped a wetter warmer world means that there's more more uh, marshes more wetlands that are producing methane more rapid uh, glacier melt the meltwater rivers coming out from under the glaciers are saturated in methane the organic material anytime you have organic material that was frozen and now it's thawed can be can experience bacterial decomposition and in the absence of oxygen produces methane so methane is a huge risk anyway thank you for listening um, 